Well, welcome everyone to the season premiere of the series, Facing Inequality. I'm James Foster, co-director of the Institute for International Economic Policy, or IIEP, at the George Washington University in our nation's capital. I'm also the moderator of today's conversation on inequality with Tulane professor Norda Lustig and her co-author Guido Neidhofer of the ZEW Leibniz Center, who will present short and long run distributional impacts of COVID-19 in Latin America. Now to most people, Nora is a world expert on income distribution and redistribution, especially in Latin America. But I'll always remember a cold call I received 20 years ago from someone at Brookings who asked more probing questions than I can remember about the measurement of poverty and inequality. That was Nora and also the president of the university where I taught one summer in Mexico. That was Nora. And also the previous occupant of my own office in the Elliott School. That was Nora before she moved to Tulane. Thank you, Nora, for returning to GW today, even if it has to be virtually. And thank you, Guido, for joining the fun. And when you see him, please thank your third co-author, Mariano Tomasi, who I had the pleasure of meeting in Argentina just last week, and I understand, Steve, that you know, Stephen, that you know him as well. Our discussants today are remarkable scholars in their own right. My GW colleague, Stephen Kaplan, is a political scientist who specializes in the political economy of global finance and development in Latin American politics as well. But in his distant past, he was also an economic anal analyst at the New York Fed. He is also an IAP affiliate. Thank you, Stephen, for being here today. Our second discussant is Michael Wolfson, who is in the Faculty of Medicine in the School of Epidemiology and Public Health at the University of Ottawa. But don't let that fool you. He was Assistant Chief Statistician in Stats Canada, and among his many papers on income distribution is one I'm particularly proud of on measuring polarization, which we essentially wrote in a weekend. Michael, thank you for spending part of your Canadian Thanksgiving with us here south of the border. Now, for those of you who've never attended an IAP event before, you can expect an informative and nonpartisan exchange of views on topics like digital trade, global governance, US-China economic relations, and urbanization and poverty. Our last event featured Nobel laureate Muhammad Yunus with a revolutionary view that what COVID-19 has uncovered should be firmly kept in view as we think and rethink about capitalism and democracy. Next week, Raghu Ram Rajan and Bina Agarwal will join us in our Envisioning India series for a panel discussion on COVID-19 in India, while at the end of the month, the new Chief Economist of the World Bank, Carmen Reinhart, takes a virtual five-minute walk from bank headquarters to Elliott to present the keynote address of our 13th annual US-China conference with many more episodes to follow. If you ever miss an IAP event, you can find videos on our YouTube channel, IIEPGW, or by going to the website at iiep.gwu.edu. Please have a look. Today's episode of Facing Inequality is the first in the new fall se uh, season and our eighth in our overall series, <clears throat> which began with Branko Milanovic <clears throat> several months back and has continued with contributions from speakers and discussions across multiple disciplines. Our last conversation was with political scientist Nita Rudra on informal workers in India and how they view globalization. Now to introduce today's speakers and to provide the rationale for our Facing Inequality series is my good colleague, GW historian Trevor Jackson, who himself is an expert on inequality and one of its causes, economic crises. Trevor? Well, thank you for uh, introducing the series and uh, an indication of what today's talk is about. Uh, this series emerged in the before times um, as an in-person interdisciplinary seminar uh, hosted by myself and our excellent colleague, Brian Stewart of GW's Econ Department, uh, in which we realized that although there are established many different subjects in which historians, economists, economic historians speak across interdisciplinary lines, uh, that inequality was perhaps the most fruitful and 
politically salient and urgent topic that might give us a common language to discuss. And the more we talked about this, the more we realized that uh, although, for instance, few historians believe that they work on inequality, uh, if you think about it differently, perhaps that's the only thing we work on. And so we thought that inequality might be a subject that could bring together academics and policymakers, historians, economists, political scientists, epidemiologists, um, people working in all sorts of different venues and times and places to try to create a kind of common language to think about research and perhaps produce policy on uh, ways to understand and to mitigate different patterns of inequality. That was already the case before the pandemic and I think has only become more urgent and salient since then. Um, so we're very happy to have a second uh, season of Facing Inequality. Stay tuned for further talks. Our next will be the historian Catherine Olivarius uh, from Stanford, who will be speaking in a couple of weeks on her upcoming book about immunocapital, uh, which is to say immunity in Louisiana um, in the antebellum period. So as James has said, our speaker for today is Nora Lustig, um, who will be speaking to us about the distributional impacts of COVID um, in Latin America, along with her co-author Guido Neidhofer, and our discussants about whom I am tasked to say, with the pleasure of saying a few more words, uh, Stephen Kaplan is Associate Professor of Political Science and International Affairs at the Department of Political Science here at GW, and currently a fellow at the Wilson Center. He researches and teaches on the frontiers of international and comparative political economy, uh, and specializes in the political economy of global finance and development, as well as the politics of macroeconomic policymaking, Chinese foreign economic policy, and Latin American politics. Um, and joining him, we are very pleased to have Michael Wolfson, uh, who has his PhD in economics from Cambridge from 1977, and has had a long and distinguished career as a public servant in Canada, uh, being such things as assistant chief statistician uh, at Statistics Canada, um, serving in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Ottawa, holding positions on the Treasury Board, the Deputy's Prime Minister Office, um, and not but least co-authoring with James Foster. Uh, so I think with that introduction, we will turn it over to our speakers. The discussants will offer some comments at the end, and we'll have space for question and comment from the audience. So with that, take it away. Excellent. Yeah, well, first of all, let me thank uh... James and Trevor for inviting us to present this work. It's uh, a pleasure to be back at GW. And like I said earlier, I hope that uh, it will happen also in person, not too, in the, not too much in the distant future. Um, I am trying to see here where to find the, hang on. Yeah, okay. So I'm going to share my uh, PowerPoint here with you which uh, is going to make it easier for me to convey what we're going to be talking about today. This is work that we've been doing with our uh, third co-author, Mariano Tomasi, who can't be with us today. Today is Columbus Day, so some people in Argentina are taking the day off. Uh, but uh, with Guido and uh, Mariano and I, we've been working on trying to uh, sort of uh, determine what may be the short and long-term distributional impacts of uh, COVID. Uh, in particular, what we're presenting today is really not for the entire region. It's going to focus on the four largest countries, Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, and Mexico. And I guess uh, the first part is going to be the one that I'm going to be presenting, focuses on the short-term effects. By short-term, we mean within the year uh, 2020. And uh, in both cases, really what we're using are simulations since we don't have data yet to really track what exactly is going on. As time goes by, we'll be able to compare our projections more easily with what uh, actually happened in, in reality. But so far we are using, uh, in our case, uh, micro simulations to predict, to forecast what we think may be happening in terms of inequality and poverty in Latin America, in the short term, like I said, and the long term, we're going to capture one of the dimensions uh, of the long term impacts, which has to do primarily through what uh, it means in terms of um, human capital, human capital destruction in particular, uh, the fact that you had these massive school closings happening in the region. 
So Latin America, as you know, turned out to be an epicenter of both the uh, disease itself, but also the economic fallout. Uh, if you compare with other regions, developing countries, um, and emerging economies in, in the world, I think Latin America is actually doing worse than practically everybody else. Sub-Saharan Africa is doing better, both on the epidemiological and economic front. Um, it's a nation not to speak of, except maybe with India. I don't know what uh, was going on in India. I'll, I'll hear next week what uh, Raju has to say. But uh, it's uh, sort of like, unfortunately, at the top of infections and death for 100,000 inhabitants, it's part of the top 10, more or less. And overall, uh, so far, the IMF uh, had uh, come out with a number of projections in terms of contraction of GDP of the order of almost uh, 9% for countries except for uh, Colombia and Mexico a little higher. Tomorrow we'll have the new projections from the WIO that's going to be released by the IMF and we'll, we'll see to what extent these have worsened or improved. So regarding the short term uh, impact, we are actually addressing three main questions here. Uh, what is the potential impact of the COVID-19 induced lockdowns, although we look at it in a broader sense, it's not just the lockdowns, it's the economic dislocation caused by by the lockdowns and by the crisis themselves on inequality and poverty. Who are the biggest losers across the pre-crisis income distribution? And to what extent the expanded social assistance programs is mitigating the negative impact both on inequality and poverty in these uh, four countries. And what we're doing is essentially using an accounting non-behavioral, that's what accounting means here, micro simulation methodology. Uh, let me start with a summary of the key results. The large negative impact of the crisis on inequality and poverty is important. I mean, it's large. The biggest losses are not among the poorest, but what we call the middle deciles, which span primarily the moderate poor, those who are vulnerable falling below the poverty line, and also uh, part of the middle class. However, we also found that the expanded social assistance programs, in particular in Brazil, in which is pretty large, and Argentina, which is also fairly large, have the potential of offsetting these effects in a non-trivial way. In the case of Colombia, which has spent much less on uh, the uh, compensating uh, social assistance, the impact is less. And in the case of Mexico, that has not increased any of the social assistance programs, the effect is nil. So in the uh, process of simulating the, the effects, what we do is we try, we first identify which are the income uh, from um, individuals that are aggregated to households that may be at risk as a result of the uh, pandemic. And essentially we distinguish between the uh, non-essential and essential sectors and non-essential sectors being the ones that are primarily going to be at risk. Uh, also, labor income from street vending, regardless of which sector people are working on, and household income from rents, because we've seen that rents, in particular, they uh, have been affected also by, by COVID from some of the uh, work that has been capturing things that happen uh, on the spot. And uh, the identification of the essential sectors is based on either uh, statutory uh, the statutory uh, laws in the countries that were passed to define what's essential and non-essential, or we also relied on ILO when that information was not available. And here I'm going to show you the first graph, which uh, turns out to be quite interesting because it shows the composition of income uh, by, um, by per capita uh, household income from the poorest to the richest for the four countries. And uh, we have distinguished the orange is the pre-existing social assistance programs. The gray is pensions, primarily contributory pensions. The light blue is public employment. The green is from the private sector, but the one that's not at risk. And the dark blue is the income that would be at risk. And the vertical lines identify the various uh, lines that may distinguish between the poor and the extreme poor, and also the middle class. 
uh, the um, the broken line, I believe it's the uh, the, the the moderate poverty line, uh, and the uh, the first one is the extreme poverty line. And uh, I think what's interesting to see from here is that because of the large expansion uh, of conditional and in some cases non-conditional cash transfer programs that has occurred in the last 25 years in the region, the poorest tend to have a cushion that uh, is protected during the uh, during shocks because those are uh, transfers that were already there. Uh, we also see that pensions and public employment provide a cushion of different degrees, in some cases going even to the poorest in the case of Argentina, but that's primarily urban areas, not so much in Colombia and Mexico. And another thing to notice in this uh, in these graphs is that the uh, you already can see that because of the distribution, the, the distribution of the composition of income across income distribution has a sort of like a U shape, the, uh, you can begin to guess who's going to be hurt the most because uh, this U shape is what drives the results uh, that we're going to see later. Okay, so uh, I'm going to skip the methodology. Then, if you want, we can come back if you, there are questions. But uh, I thought, you know, what are the uh, programs that we're contemplating here that we're simulating, because like I said, we're going to simulate the impact on the income distribution without the expanded social assistance and with the expanded social assistance, we have captured the most important programs, not all of them. And please note that in the case of Brazil, according to our data, the new programs cover about 53 million people and they are about, they have a cost of about 2% of GDP. In the case of Argentina, about 9 million people and around 1% of GDP is being spent on that, much less in Colombia and nothing in Mexico, as I said, because there's not been an expansion of the social assistance programs. So what's the impact on inequality? Uh, here, what we can see in these graphs, let me walk you through you, through this. The first, the first bar, which is the one that has the diagonal, is the pre-COVID uh, shock in Gini coefficient. And then we have the uh, exposed gray and red before the impact of uh, the so expanded social assistance. And the next two is what happens after you have the expanded social assistance. The two uh, bars here refer to two scenarios that are in a way extreme because we don't know if an aggregate contraction right now uh, is distributed more concentrated among a certain amount of families that lose a lot of income or more families that lose less. Uh, so we call this the first one, the concentrated uh, scenario, and this one, the dispersed effect scenario. And as will be expected, because there's more people who become extremely poor during the, if we're in the under the concentrated scenario, the increase in uh, inequality would be higher. But you can see that the Gini coefficient, the projected increases in the Gini coefficient are of the order of three, four Gini points, which is very large. Once you introduce the uh, expanded social assistance, uh, however, the mitigation is also very important. And interestingly, in the case of Brazil, which uh, for us was very strange, but then others have found the same thing in, in Brazil, in Ipea, and Getulio Vargas, and others that looked at this, that if the uh, impact, the negative income is in the sort of, is dispersed among families, the compensation that the social, new social assistance or expanded social assistance has produced could actually result in lower inequality than the pre-pandemic. Okay, this is uh, uh, strange, but apparently it is not impossible that this has been happening in Brazil. In the case of Mexico, because there is no expanded social assistance, the increase in inequality will be as high as the pandemic implies. So what about the effect on poverty? Uh, on poverty, the results are sort of similar. 
we show them here for the national poverty line. And as you can see, again, in the case of Brazil, if we are in the uh, dispersed uh, scenario, actually almost there's no increase in poverty in the post pandemic after you take into account the social assistance, the expansion of social assistance program. In the case of Mexico, the rise, the expected rise in poverty could be quite large, as we can see here, in either of the concentrated or the dispersed um, losses scenario. So we see that uh, bottom line, the 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 the, uh, the results. And uh, by the way, here I show the results with the 550 poverty line, which makes it comparable across countries, since the poverty lines, uh, the national poverty lines, are not the same across countries. And uh, again, we see that in Brazil and Argentina, the impact is mitigated quite a bit by the safety nets. Little in the case of Colombia and none in Mexico. This here is an interesting graph because the previous uh, measures, as we know, are anonymous. We always re-rank households from the poorest to the richest when we're comparing uh, the income distribution or uh, measuring poverty. But here we fix households by the pre-shock income distribution and we trace, we track how income losses affect them through uh, the entire distribution. And uh, we have it here by centiles. And the solid line shows the effect of what is the shock before we uh, include the um, compensating uh, measures from the expanded uh, social assistance programs. And as you can see in general, it is not necessarily the poorest who are the ones that are being hurt the most in the pre-pandemic, in the, sorry, in the post-pandemic shock. And definitely they're not being hurt the most once you take into account the expansion of the social um, assistance programs. The concentration of the losses start more in the moderate poor, in those that are vulnerable to becoming poor, and also in part of the middle classes. And uh, this, again, is an interesting result that is uh, warning us that, uh, well, I mean, it's good news that the poor are being protected the most. Uh, and it's uh, concerning that people who might fall uh, below the poverty line are not protected enough, especially if they could get trapped into poverty, those who are near. Um, so more results, we also did a little bit of analysis looking at what happens if you divide uh, the pop divide the population, uh, taking into account race and ethnicity and gender. And we found that in the case of Brazil, the impact on uh, households whose head were upper descendants or indigenous was higher, but so was also the expand the compensatory mechanisms of the expanded social assistance. So they did not end up uh, worse off. Uh, relatively speaking. Again, the incidence is much higher for these groups. And the same thing happened for gender. So the conclusions are that the bottom line, the impact of the crisis on inequality and poverty before any social assistance is large by any measure. The, um, by the way, in our analysis, because we do not assume, assume that uh, income distribution stays the same, the increases in poverty that we estimate are higher than uh, some of the other work that's being out there, including by the by the World Bank that assume equiproportional contractions. Uh, we also show that the non-anonymous uh, GICs, the growth incidence curves that I showed you earlier, indicate that those who are hurt the most are not necessarily the poorest. And we also showed that in the countries in which the expanded uh, safety net was uh, significant, the offsetting effects are Im very important and could be mitigating the impact on the poor in cash terms, very importantly so. Let me finish before I turn the, the mic to, to Guido with three things. Well, I mean, maybe the poor are not hurt the most, but any hurt to the poor can be quite devastating, as we know, because small absolute declines in income could be uh, very dramatic in terms of what it means for the poor being able to uh, do uh, to sort of, uh, to, to the living conditions. 
In addition, as we know, the poor are suffering from multiple deprivations that have been exacerbated during the crisis, as the work that uh, your former colleagues have been showing, James, in Oxford. Uh, they, the, the effects have been exacerbated in many of the dimensions of, uh, that the poor experience deprivations on, and they interact with each other in ways that are quite uh, terrible during pandemic, pandemic because the vicious cycles are worse than during any other, even other crisis, no, I would say. Um, so the poor may be relatively protected by the expanded uh, social assistance that happens in the countries in which it's big, but this happens in the cash dimension and not necessarily in the other dimensions. And finally, even if in the short term you have been able to cushion the income shock to uh, some degree for the poor, their long-term impacts in terms of what happens to human capital, especially of the children of the poor, may be uh, very long-lasting. We know that during crisis in the past, people have studied there is impact on nutrition. And in this case, we know that there's going to be a significant impact on schooling due to primarily the school closures uh, and other shocks that are affecting poor families. And Guido is going to show the results that we've been trying to, uh, well, that we're, tr we're trying to sort of assess also the longer term impact in terms of particularly high school completion rates as a result of this uh, short term shock on schooling and what it means for then the human capital of the poor in the future and inequality and poverty in the future. So let me stop here. Thank you. So thanks a lot. Then I will start my sharing my screen. So thanks a lot. Thanks a lot uh, to to the entire Institute, of course, to James to Trevor for the invitation. It's really an honor to be here and, and may present this um, the second part of our paper. Um, thanks to Nora for, for, for the, uh, presenting the first part where we look at the short run um, distributional impacts. And here, as Nora said, we try to assess also the long run effects uh, through a prognosis of the intergenerational persistence of uh, the pandemic in uh, Latin, in these four Latin American countries, uh, which we've seen in the in the first part. I hope you can see my my screen. Um, if yes, uh, I, I continue. That's great. Um, fantastic. So and what so basically, the exercise is to um, to try to assess, to give a prognosis on the effect of the pandemic on today's children, um, and the, so on the quality of opportunity, uh, which uh, leads to um, the long run distribution of resources and so on. And we try to assess this with with the simulation and the counterfactual exercise. And we could start the tale um, of uh, what was the world before COVID-19, which um, now now, looking at the situation in which we are now, seems uh, almost prehistoric. We could start the tale with uh, once upon a time in Latin America, um, where, where we, we saw a region with uh, um, rising probability of upward mobility and education, driven by um, educational expansions and higher um, likelihoods of uh, disadvantaged children to complete secondary education. Um, this is something that we observed in the in the region um, together with uh, the um, with the with the slowdown in economic inequality. Also, however, then um, there was uh, COVID nineteen, and uh, one aspect of this, as Nora said, is the uh, school closures um, that uh, that um, the that had to be enacted by by governments to stop the, or to at least to uh, hold back the the outbreak of the pandemic and this led to asymmetric asymmetric uh, situations among family which uh, of course will have um, repercussions on the human capital of children and uh, this is one of the aspects and the main aspect which we are trying to address in uh, this second part of of this analysis 
So the idea and the aim is to estimate the effects of the pandemic shock on the education of today's children, on the human capital and the education of today's children. And we do this with a uh, counterfactual scenario um, similar to the one uh, or similar to the idea, similar to the first part of the paper. Um, but in this case, we what we what we try to to ask is uh, uh, what if past cohorts about which or past uh, generations about which we know um, their education, their level of education, um, would have experienced such a situation as today. What would have happened to their um, to their human capital, and or um, what would have happened to the equality of opportunity of uh, uh, these generations? And um, this way, we can learn uh, about today's situation, which repercussions. It will have on the future, and we try to analyze these three channels. The main one is the school closure. However, we try to model also inside uh, the health shock um, to the household due to the outbreak of COVID-19, and uh, also the parental job loss or income loss um, measured in the way that uh, Nora have shown us in the first part of the analysis. So the main takeaways of the second part are how strong could the shock affect educational inequality and inequality of opportunity in Latin America as a long run site on this, you know, and uh, uh, do public policies have been able to mitigate the negative impact uh, of the pandemic in the four countries, Argentina, Brazil, Colombia and Mexico. And the uh, exercise, the counterfactual exercise, which I won't explain in detail, but I give, will give an over, uh, uh, sorry, an intuitive overview of, of how, of what we measure, um, works like this. We have, we know the actual level of education of, of individuals, and we simulate them the um, pandemic uh, shock on uh, their instructional time, which here in this equation is uh, shown by Kappa. Um, Kappa is, uh, the educational loss which uh, people experienced in the different countries uh, in this year, in this pandemic year. And in itself, it depends on two, uh, on two uh, factors. The one is the actual instructional loss, which we estimate for each country. This instructional loss, which is chi uh, star, um, depends on, of course, the days of school uh, lost due to the pandemic, which um, depends on the closure of schools, the date of uh, school closure and the eventual reopening, um, and then also on mitigation strategies. Okay, mitigation strategies, in this case, educational mitigation strategies, which governments have enacted to uh, reduce the learning loss among, among pupils. And these learning, uh, the, sorry, these mitigation strategies comprise offline education, so uh, education uh, via cell phone, uh, via TV shows in, in national TV, uh, radio, or printed copies, like for example, here in Argentina, if you see my video, I'm holding. Uh, one of these printed copies that here in Argentina were distributed uh, nationally uh, to um, to all families with uh, small children. Um, so this is what uh, we model as offline education, as mitigation strategies on the offline level. But then also online education, we know that many countries and many schools um, try to continue education online but in this case of course we have to take into account that not all uh, families have access to internet and this depends on the internet coverage in the socioeconomic groups and the distribution of uh, internet government coverage in socioeconomic groups in the country so we take this also into account in the model to uh, compute the instructional loss which then can be different by countries but also by um, uh, by socioeconomic group then here we take also into account the outbreak of COVID-19 and the possibility of uh, parental job loss and household income loss, which we know from the literature also have an effect uh, of, uh, on um, educational outcomes of children.
So this is on the supply side, we could say. So the supply of education, the instruction loss, which totally depends on the supply of education uh, and uh, other factors like the, the outbreak and the parental job loss. Um, but then uh, this factor is also interacted with what we uh, call here alpha, which is the parental factor of substitution. So we are taking into account that some families in this time might be able, because of some characteristics of the parents, and their ability, for example, to support the children in the educational process might be more able than others to uh, substitute formal schooling, okay? So alpha in this case might be between zero and one, and the alpha of zero means that uh, the child is uh, not suffering any loss and any instructional loss in this year because uh, his or her parents are able to fully substitute regular schooling, which uh, um, is not taking place in this very particular year. On the other extreme, uh, the parental factor of substitution might be, so alpha might be one in this case, which means that uh, the parents are not uh, in the, in the uh, have, uh, so the capabilities of parents are not such that they can actually um, help their children with, uh, with uh, the education process and with schooling, which means that these children completely depend on the supply side. So these children uh, completely suffer the entire shock uh, of the instructional loss given by the factors within K star. Okay? To give you an idea on how we measure this, I would like to show you this table where, where we have for uh, these four countries that we analyze, Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, and Mexico, um, all the elements of, uh, of the instruction that define the instructional loss, and finally, the, uh, expected, um, the expected instructional loss among socioeconomic groups. So what you see here, for example, comparing Argentina and Mexico, we have small t, which is um, uh, the days actually, uh, so how many days schools have been closed, assuming that in Argentina schools are reopening on the 1st of November. This is the amount of days lost due to the pandemic, which is higher in Argentina than it is in Mexico. However, Argentina did more on the offline and online education side, okay? And we, we can discuss the details of it later and how we, we measure it uh, and which data we use, but we uh, our our investigations show that on this side Argentina did more than Mexico, and also that the distribution of internet coverage among socioeconomic groups is uh, more evenly distributed in Argentina than in Mexico. So this finally leads us to an expected instructional loss among individuals in socioeconomic group J, which is. Uh, uh, very similar at the top of the distribution, so for highly educated parents, but very different at the bottom of the distribution. So on average, children of illiterate parents uh, in Argentina lost 35% uh, of their instructional time. That's what uh, our average um, estimates show. And uh, in Mexico, almost 60%. Okay, um, so we, we, we dig a bit deeper into this, um, simulating then the effects at the individual level of, of the pandemic using microdata from, from Latino Barometer, which is a representative survey of 18 Latin American countries. Um, and what we do is to measure the likelihood then to complete secondary education given the instructional loss. And we are particularly interested in this exercise in uh, uh, children at the margin, so that made the secondary education, but not more in a regular scenario. And now due to the pandemic might uh, fall behind and, and not, uh, get, not, not uh, receive or complete secondary education due to the instructional loss uh, that they suffered in uh, the pandemic. And this uh, uh, graph um, shows uh, all our main results, which we'll discuss together. As uh, you see, we have uh, each country here and uh, three categories of, of uh, parental education. So we look at individuals whose parents have low, middle, and high education. Low one are the, the red ones, are the red bars. Middle are the yellow bars and uh, high educated parents, the, the blue bars. And what the bars show is the likelihood of children with uh, this level of parental education um, to complete secondary education. First, 
looking at the regular school year, so the situation without uh, COVID-19, um, which shows that that um, in all countries, um, the of course the likelihood of children from low educated parents to uh, receive or to complete secondary education is lower than uh, parents in the middle and especially at the top of the distribution. Um, and we see also uh, differences by countries, but what we are interested here is what um, shows us our simulation of the COVID-19 shock um, in, in, in this regard. And here we have four different possibilities um, which we look at. First, um, the, the first bar on, on the left after the regular school year shows uh, the worst case scenario. So if the entire year is lost, but to the degree alpha. So this means taking into account that parents may substitute uh, formal schooling and that uh, parents with higher education are more able to substitute higher schooling. So um, this is the, the first scenario of uh, the entire year you lost. Then in the second scenario, which is the bar on the right of the entire year lost, uh, shows how this is mitigated by educational policies. Okay, so the, the online and offline education tools and the, the things I've shown you before are uh, here uh, mitigating the impact of um, the school closure on the human capital of, of children. Then we take also into account uh, household income loss that could have an effect, a further effect on uh, the instruction of children. And uh, as we did in the first part of the analysis, we look at this income loss before and after, or, or basically with and without um, uh, the mitigation by social assistance. So there are some takeaways of this graph. So the first one is uh, that um, in every country, uh, there is a instructional loss. And in all countries, this instruction loss is concentrated on uh, the low and uh, middle part of the distribution, so on children of low and middle uh, educated parents, and especially uh, it is particularly strong for uh, children of low educated parents. This is the first takeaway. The second takeaway is that there have been some mitigation by educational policies, so online, offline education, and so on. However, um, we, we only only record uh, an, uh, a mitigating effect in Argentina and uh, Colombia um, and uh, um, in, in a very, very small uh, one in, in the other two countries, Brazil and, and Mexico, especially at the bottom of the distribution. And then another takeaway is uh, that uh, the game is actually played, so the game of instructional loss is played uh, because of the school closure and educational uh, policies. So the additional effect that we measure uh, um, that derives from the income loss is relatively small here. Um, so these are the, the three um, the three main takeaways uh, that uh, we, we attribute to to this analysis. So what, what does this mean? What does this mean for the uh, looking at the historical perspective? So what we have seen is that the, um, the probability to get a secondary degree is uh, much lower for this course than it would have been in a regular, having a regular school year. And how much does this throw us back looking at the history of upward mobility in education in Latin America? So Due to so our estimations show that this could be um, a draw or a fallback even by uh, 20 percentage points in upward mobility on average of all countries, and uh, this somehow uh, mirrors the um, probability that uh, children in the 50s uh, had uh, so of children of low educated or disadvantaged background uh, had um, to uh, complete. Um, the secondary degree. So it's it's uh, it, it, if if this scenario is confirmed and uh, it seems that it will be substantial, then uh, th we might expect these for the cohorts that now are in school that uh, it will be really uh, um, a fallback by by of the of the progress that have been made in the last years, a substantial fallback, and uh, so 
it will be important that uh, that it's an important issue to account for um, to uh, reduce the, the the strong impact that this pandemic could have on the human capital of disadvantaged children. So to look at educational opportunities, um, what we do is to compare the um, probability of uh, low and uh, high background uh, students to attain a secondary or to complete secondary education. And here we see that uh, from uh, uh, from an uh, equal opportunity scenario, which is here shown by, by one, um, we were already far away in uh, the regular um, in the in uh, regular times, but uh, that uh, due to COVID-19, uh, this uh, equal opportunity scenario could be even more far away, and uh, so so there there are there are really a lot of of uh, situations that um, show that the long run impact uh, could be uh, much stronger than even than the short run scenario uh, have have shown. So, of course, there are some caveats of this analysis. I will very quickly go through this um, so that we do not take into account that there could be uh, cumulative effects of the learning loss also to other years. And also, we do not take into account additional effects on other features like nutrition, obesity, mental health, teenage pregnancy, which are all very important, and show that these estimates might even be a lower bound that, um, that uh, so um, that these uh, probably will affect even more disadvantaged children, these features that I write down here, and um, that our estimates may only show the, you know, the tip of the iceberg of the problem. And um, where we do not know uh, in, in our analysis in which direction the bias goes if, is uh, uh, if all children are not affected at the same age, which is the case, so we assume in our analysis, it's somehow, uh, the, the effect is somehow the same for all ages and in all grades. Um, and he, in this case, the bias is not clear, but uh, we safely can assume that anyway, um, also if uh, our, if this biases our estimates upward, this is unlikely to offset the entire effect. So let me sum up. So the asymmetric COVID-19 shock uh, is, is a danger for equality of opportunity, not only in Latin America, but in the but worldwide and but maybe particularly in, in Latin America because of its specificities. And we have seen that educational mitigation strategies um, are, are have not been sufficient so far uh, to close uh, entirely the gap. So um, um, in in the first part of the analysis, we have seen uh, the effectiveness in some countries of uh, economic uh, mitigation strategies. Educational mitigation strategies seem to have been uh, uh, less effective in, in this sense. Um, and this shows us also something for increase for uh, long run inequality, because we know that uh, higher in, that inequality in Latin America depends on the uh, and everywhere, but in Latin America, the decrease in uh, um, income inequality depended on uh, the skill premia, on, on falling skill premia. And now if uh, the relative returns to skirts are increasing due to this crisis, then this may also cause higher inequality in the long run. So let me conclude. Um, thinking a bit about what can be done, of course, one million dollar question, right? So let me let me tell you some thoughts on this. Um, just uh, you know, thinking about the second part of the long run effects. So one is uh, somehow to so COVID nineteen taught us also to uh, rethink schooling, so to develop uh, tools to sustain the learning process. Um, inside the school, of course, but mainly also outside the school. So together with the families, um, and there have been, uh, there, there is research uh, showing how this uh, could be done, and we should try to learn more uh, of it and also invest more uh, in, in doing so. Um, but is online education enough to level the playing field for our children? No, it seems it's not. So we, we, we are working also on parallel studies, and uh, we show that the distribution of internet 
internet coverage, and we show it also, we've shown it also here, um, is uh, that doesn't make it uh, possible to just rely on online education, and uh, we would need uh, targeted infrastructural investments also to reach all children before this is uh, possible. So some recommendations are to focus on the most vulnerable children in this case uh, that uh, hired, uh, are at the highest risk to fall behind. And to do so, it will be uh, necessary to protect the financing of public education. So uh, all the social programs that we've seen also in the first part of the analysis, of course, they cost money. And uh, this money, the, 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 the fiscal impact of it um, uh, will be huge. And uh, somehow um, a refinancing will probably take place in the middle run. So one recommendation is uh, that this refinancing, uh, this these funds are not reallocated from uh, education, from public education, to other uh, to other places. Um, and uh, the last recommendation, maybe, is to benefit also from comparative advantage of international cooperation on this. So school and education are not just a national matter, and especially countries with common language could here really um, help each other into develop. Uh, uh, tools that that uh, can reach uh, everyone. So thank you very much again, uh, and thanks to the discussant uh, discussants. I'm uh, uh, I'm uh, looking forward to hear what they have to tell us about this paper. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Guido, and also uh, Nora for a fabulous description of what we can expect in terms of income and education and mobility in Latin America as a result of COVID. Now, let me turn it over to the discussant. Before I do, I just want to remind anyone who has questions in the audience, this is the time to formulate them. Uh, please, let's hear from Stephen first. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. Uh, thank you very much, IIEP. Uh, thanks to Kyle and Trevor as well. Uh, anytime I attend or participate in an IIEP event, I always find that I've learned a lot by the end. So uh, this is uh, 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 an example of that, undoubtedly. I really enjoyed uh, the paper by Nora, uh, Guido, uh, as well as Mariano. Um, I think ultimately, you know, it was such an enjoyable read. Uh, because not only is it kind of pushing the scholarly envelope, uh, but then to read sort of uh, a piece that has such important policy implications simultaneously during such an important time, uh, it was really terrific. So thank you very much for sharing it uh, with our community. Uh, I'll divide my comments into two sets of points. Uh, the first set will be on the long-term mechanism uh, and thinking about maybe sort of additional suggestions for how sort of the, the COVID shock might be affecting uh, long-term accumulation of human capital. Uh, the second uh, set of comments will focus more on the shorter term and the social interventions taken in Latin America and what might explain some of that variation throughout the region. Uh, so, first of all, in terms of the mechanism uh, that we just looked at, uh, that uh, Guido had sort of walked us through, uh, and thinking about sort of the shock uh, to educational attainment, uh, to my knowledge, in terms of uh, listening to the talk and reading through the paper, uh, I had a shorter version, uh, but essentially, you know, to some extent, right, uh, if, I, if I divide my comments between the supply and the demand side, right, on the demand side, you have parents, and then sort of the key factors in determining to what extent parents can construct, right, an alternative substitute or even maximize, right, the, 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 the education that is coming uh, their students' ways really depends upon their level of education as well as their resources. Uh, one thing I was thinking about in terms of another factor that might be key during the pandemic to think about uh, would also be time, right? Because if I think of beyond educational attainment and resources, something that also the pandemic has distributive effects for would be time, right? There's some families, notwithstanding their income level, uh, families, you know, particularly of, uh, you know, non-essential workers, where you know you may have people in the home get, that can even help facilitate uh, some of this asynchronous uh, learning in terms of the TV shows, in terms of the books uh, that that Guido had shared, for example, in Argentina. Uh, and so there's a the question of okay, does that time make a difference, right? And so on some level, uh, when you're looking indeed on the demand side, uh, maybe then non-essential workers would have more time than essential workers of similar education attainment levels, right? And so that 
this differential in time among uh, parents may also be having a factor on that demand side and the ability to kind of construct uh, good substitutes, right? So the potential uh, to see whether time can then uh, become a variable as well. I think you can also pull this through uh, to the supply side as well. Uh, it looks like in your index, if I understand the K star correctly, there's both a synchronous and an asynchronous component. It appears as though they're weighted equally, I was wondering whether you could actually create a measure where perhaps the extent to which this is true, maybe synchronous learning is actually a higher level of learning than the asynchronous learning. If that is true, could you develop a different weight, right? And then depending upon people's time, that would suggest that maybe access to technology might even be more important than what the paper is currently finding, right? It's already something that's highly important. But there is a question, could it be even more important, right? Uh, because in an asynchronous learning environment, parents that can muster that time variable might be able to take advantage of these outputs or alternatives supplied by the school more so than other parents. If it's synchronous and everyone has access to the same technology, perhaps uh, it's a little more uh, equal from a distributive standpoint. Um, so I think this could have real bearings perhaps on the recommendation as well. I think on page 16 in the paper, uh, you highlight sort of the literature in general underscores the importance of cash transfers and improving educational outcomes. You're sort of billing your paper is then saying, okay, uh, this is quite important. You need to have these cash transfers, right? We're showing the importance of this. But then sort of in your slides, you were just mentioning this, right? And then you, it also comes out in the difference of internet coverage between Argentina and Mexico as well. But there also seems to be a really important policy implication of not only investing in cash transfers, but technology and infrastructure, right? Um, and so I think the key question is, why is there so much reliance on cash transfers? Um, is it sort of cost, right? Uh, certainly in a place like DC, you've seen interventions that have not only been on transfer level, but also sort of, uh, you know, outreach in terms of technology as well. Have Latin American governments been able to do this or are, 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 is it cost prohibitive? If so, does this open up possibilities for aid community, uh, development aid communities, international institutions? Might this be kind of a good target area uh, sort of in uh, the age of uh, COVID? My second set of recommendations or, or thoughts about the paper focus on the shorter run sort of interventions, right? Uh, obviously, these are highly important results that we see, the extent to which within Latin America, those countries have had stronger social interventions like Argentina and Brazil have been more successful at mitigating uh, these shocks uh, compared to countries like Colombia and Brazil. Uh, I'm sorry, Colum pardon me, Colombia and Mexico. What I wanna do is sort of ask a series of questions intended to better understand this variation, right? And what it might mean from a policymaking standpoint. One, I was sort of surprised right, when I read, given Mexico has been a forerunner in conditional cash transfers historically, albeit for the poorer communities within Mexico, uh, they're sort of surprising that there hasn't been a willingness to use cash transfers to mitigate the effects of the current crisis, right? Particularly with the most vulnerable workers, I found this really surprising. Any kind of priors in terms of why Mexico has been less willing to do this, right? I think that's sort of a fascinating uh, puzzle uh, that the empirics sort of shines a light on. Uh, similarly, you know, in Argentina and Brazil, we have very different partisan IDs left and right, but a willingness to intervene in these expanded social safety nets, even more so than Colombia and Mexico. Why, again, what might explain this variation? I can think of lots of possibilities ranging from a history of ISI uh, to union density, uh, even political machines that are used to targeting poor voters. But then also given this uh, you know, differentiation that Nora pointed to between the middle, middle classes and lower classes, <clears throat> perhaps it might also be in Argentina and Brazil, there's much more of a history of kind of targeting uh, middle classes through the welfare system. Perhaps it's a reflection of this. Um, finally, also, I thought there was a, a bit of a puzzle with Colombia where you see, you know, the tally is six programs. I think it only adds up to about 0.3% of GDP, but it begs the question of, okay, why are there all these programs? And then sort of, you know, is it just that they're not really capitalized to that large of an extent? Um, have they not fully utilized resources or notwithstanding the extent of programs? Uh, you know, it just hasn't been a priority from a financing standpoint. I think that's sort of also a little curious in terms of Colombia. 
Uh, so those are my comments, both on the long term and the short term. Uh, I look forward to your answers as well as the other discussing comments. Uh, but this has been a terrific uh, paper and I really enjoyed reading it. Thank you very much. So Stephen, thanks so much. Uh, Beyond Cash, great, and uh, puzzles. So let's move on now to Michael Wolfson. Hi, can you hear me all right? Am I, is my video on? I don't know. Uh, well, first, let me thank you, James, and, and colleagues there at the Institute for the opportunity to comment on these papers. They were really interesting to me. I don't spend uh, very much time at all uh, in this area, but uh, it's great to be able to uh, have read the paper and to uh, appreciate its results and uh, make some uh, comments. I'm going to start with the first part on the uh, uh, economic uh, slowdown. It's a very important analysis. And the impacts, uh, as I've been shown, are, and in reality, I'm sure, are almost certainly highly uneven by income group and more generally by socioeconomic uh, status. The method, I'm going to talk about the techie stuff, is completely appropriate given the available data using large scale representative household surveys and then using micro simulation to construct counterfactuals as if. The incomes had been hit by the various workplace closures and lockdowns. I assume it's a challenge to identify just which sectors and kinds of income would be affected given problems of data availability. So the assumptions here do look uh, plausible. Uh, a caveat with those uh, very nice and important centile graphs for the four countries, uh, they're called per capita households, but does this mean that a uh, five-person household with the same income as a one-person household would have one-fifth uh, the income uh, along uh, the horizontal axis. It's uh, pretty standard to use something called an equivalent scale where one takes account of the economies of scale of living together uh, in a single uh, dwelling unit. Uh, it was a nifty idea, I thought, to construct this 10 by 10 matrix of possible impacts on the percentage of households and the percentage of incomes, because one doesn't have data, I gather, to be able to tell uh, whether the impact was uh, concentrated or uh, dispersed, uh, as the authors have uh, indicated. So you, they've used a, a range of scenarios and then chose two polar cases that represent what they think the amount of economic impact uh, building on an IMF uh, projection uh, really was. Um, but uh, it's not clear to me where this uh, pass-through came from. We know that GDP, uh, according to the IMF, dropped by whatever it was, 8.5%. But how much of that affected household incomes? Uh, the national accounts have all kinds of sectors beyond the household sector. Uh, so chance for lots of slip uh, in the phrase between cup and lip. Uh, these are surveys. They're based on samples. So it would be some some helpful to have some idea of the sampling variability of these uh, uh, surveys. So some of the tables show three digits uh, of accuracy and uh, I'm a bit skeptical about whether that's really uh, within the bounds of a confidence interval. The phrase I used to use a lot uh, at StatCan was to ask people to avoid uh, spurious uh, precision. The Real power of microsimulation is the ability to construct these kinds of uh, counterfactuals. I know I have scars on my back from other economists who are critical of these kinds of microsimulation results because they fail to account for behavioral uh, change. Uh, but we have to be careful not to let the perfect uh, be the enemy of the good here. And so estimating the first round impacts in my mind is certainly uh, appropriate and uh, valuable. And furthermore, in, if we're talking about the war against the pandemic and the fog of war uh, and our highly limited data environment, I defy any uh, fan of behavioral responses or general equilibrium analysis to come up with uncontroversial or robust estimates. One of the things that wasn't clear to me in simulating the impacts of the changes that the three of the four countries' governments made is the distinction between a new program or an existing program that will respond endogenously. I don't know anything about the social 
assistance programs in, in those countries, for example, but certainly here in Canada, when the unemployment rate goes up, unemployment benefits go up. When more people uh, are out of work or poor, social assistance benefits go up automatically. So the distinction between the new program and the changes was, was not uh, uh, clear. I know the Gini coefficient is very popular, but in the more techie thinking, it's a measure, it's a summary measure of inequality, and it's one that's sensitive in the middle end of the income spectrum. Uh, so I think it's far more informative to look at the percentile uh, graphs. And indeed, because they're U-shaped, they suggest that the Lorentz curves, which is kind of the uh, gold standard for talking about unambiguous orderings of inequality, uh, probably uh, cross. So it, it would be better if you're gonna use some of your measures at all to use uh, a low, middle, and high sensitive one and better still just focus on those uh, curves. Let me turn now to the, the second paper, which looks at the longer term impacts uh, by a human capital. And it's really important to be able to move beyond the short run to consider these longer run uh, impacts and I think it certainly in Canada and my reading of what's happening uh, uh, in many countries around the world is it's generally accepted that entire industries will continue to be dramatically affected. We need to think only of airlines, tourism, restaurants, downtown office towers, retail trade where online uh, purchases uh, can substitute. And of course, education, uh, you know, the, the revolution in, online, uh, I'm not sure I'd call it learning, but online practice uh, is uh, unlikely to be 100% reversed. So this second part of the analysis focuses on schooling and its impact on human capital on the assumption that it's days and weeks of school attendance that is the main driver of the kinds of human capital that are most important for individuals' future socioeconomic status. The focus more specifically is in on on instructional time, how much is lost due to COVID, then using that as a, a predictor, the likelihood of secondary school completion, conditional on parents' education. Um, I'm reminded of Miles Korak and his Great Gatsby curve, where he looked at the correlation between parental income and child income. Uh, there's clearly a strong correlation. It varies a lot across countries. But what it suggests is there's more factors at work than um, uh, just uh, uh, educational uh, attainment. And I was a little struck by the ambiguous use, use of the term upward mobility. I think of upward mobility as something that's intergenerational, uh, not within a generation, although it was used in both uh, contexts. Uh, my main concern in, in, in this part of the analysis is that uh, instructional time or educational attainment slightly more broadly is only one of the major channels uh, for longer run impacts. The authors certainly uh, recognize this. Uh, human capital is a widely used construct uh, developed by economists by analogy to physical capital, but it misses so much that is standard fare for sociologists, psychologists, and health researchers. The importance of social networks, including uh, peers, socialization, including pro-social uh, learning versus uh, delinquency. Uh, these are certainly major concerns here as the debate in Canada unfolds about uh, school opening. I suspect it's true in other countries as well. Uh, my sense is that if the duration of uh, closing schools is not too long, then classroom learning uh, can be recovered. Uh, so the uh, question is, is uh, you know, whether this is going to be a, you know, a few more months or is it going to be a year or more? I fear it could end up being closer to the latter. But uh, there have been studies, they're rare, uh, using the OECD uh, skills uh, kinds of assessments that, <clears throat> that show if you do a regression of uh, income of adults on their educational attainment, clear correlation, but if you do it on education, educational attainment, and some measures of skills, then uh, educational attainment becomes far less important. So I worry that this human capital construct, it's, I don't wanna to be too negative here, but it's like the proverbial drunk looking for his lost keys under the lamppost. Why? Not because that's where he lost them, but that's where the light is. So we look at correlations where the data are rather than where we think uh, the real causal pathway uh, is. Um, 
but unfortunately, these things like literacy, numeracy, problem solving, cross curricular curricular competencies, and working in teams, those things that were on the OECD uh, uh, studies uh, are not nearly as often uh, measured. Nevertheless, this is an important area uh, and a, a valuable set of steps towards quantifying the longer term impacts uh, via the schooling uh, pathway. And I'm pretty sure that the conclusions uh, with regard to the fundamental importance of public education are certainly valid. So thank you very much uh, to the authors for a fascinating paper and uh, I look, the opportunity to comment and I look forward to uh, discussion. Thank you. Great, well, thank you, Michael. Um, a lot to think about, Nora and Guido. So uh, I'll let you, in fact, talk about it. Go ahead, whoever wants to go first. Okay, shall I go first uh, so that I can deal with uh, uh, Stevens and Michael's excellent comments? Thank you so much. So, I guess, Steve, uh, you're primarily interested in the sort of drivers of different policy responses and how they're related to the political economy in, in each country. And I think that at this point, we cannot uh, really come up with a general story. Uh, they're quite specific, given the characteristics of the leaders and how they interact with their, their, their supporters, their base. In the case of Mexico, you're right to point out that uh, it's a shock, especially for people who have not been following what's been happening closely in, in, in the context of Mexico regarding what uh, the AMLO, the Lopez Obrador government, thinks about cash transfers. Uh, first of all, the traditional cash transfer program, the sort of very renowned that used to be called Progresa and at the end was called Prospera, was dismantled. Uh, that happened before the pandemic. And it's been replaced by a set of uh, programs that uh, use categorical targeting, primarily relate, related to age. Uh, so the elderly and the youth are the main recipients of current uh, programs. They have undone all the early childhood programs, uh, which is very strange for a country in which the government says that they're worried about the poor. And in addition to that, the, there's a lot of reluctance on the part of Lopez Obrador in engaging in any kind of counter-cyclical policies that may imply that uh, Mexico has to contract some, some in debt with either the World Bank or the IMF. I mean, they, they, they're trying to sort of really avoid anything that might put Mexico at a risk of having to deal with conditionality or problems, debt problems in the future. So there's not been a counter-cyclical policy at the macro level, almost, and they've not been at the micro level in terms of social assistance compensation. That so far has not really affected Lopez Obrador's uh, standing. His popularity has uh, fallen a little bit, but I think that uh, so far people at his base, which is pretty broad, continue to trust his judgment, even though they're not being helped during the pandemic. Political science, I'm not, not one so need to study why the dynamics of that is happening. In the context of Brazil, I think um, you know, for me, it's clear that Bolsonaro decided that since he didn't do much on, I mean, he's, he's put emphasis on the economy. He hasn't want to actually introduce lockdowns. As you know, he's uh, had uh, lots of fights with his various health ministers that have been replaced one after the other. And uh, I think that the cash transfers there have, uh, were designed to be large. But, but by the way, one thing that we learned that people weren't sure we could is that you can, you can implement very large programs pretty much on the spot, even going to the no informal market. So I think that going back after we've had this episode, we need to sort of learn from the cases in which the large scale uh, uh, cash transfer programs were deployed very quickly and what we learned from that. But uh, in the politics, I think what Bolsonaro was trying to do is really regain popularity, and he did. I mean, essentially what the polls have shown is that after these programs were introduced, his popularity started to rise again. And uh, if you uh, looked at uh, by socioeconomic group, it even rose among the poor. 
So he was politically driven. He had to uh, also fight with some people in his Ministry of Finance. Some resigned. If you've been following what happened also in the Ministry of Finance, but he succeeded politically. If you want to get more popularity for his policies, and Colombia has been very kind of on the prudent side to try to avoid also to engage in policies that would require uh, a larger increase in debt. Argentina and Brazil are going to have a tough time dealing with their fiscal deficits uh, in the future. And one thing that we do not look at that I should say, and it's a big caveat of our analysis, who's going to pay for all this in the future? I mean, is it going to be if it's growth, then great. There's not going to be need to increase a lot of the taxes. But if there isn't, somebody will have to pay. And we don't know whether the poor will be spared in the future from having to pay for the expanded social assistance today with higher consumption taxes. So let me stop here regarding Steve's comment. And I, I want to now comment on Michael's. I think that your uh, suggestions, perhaps, of uh, you know presenting confidence intervals it's a good idea. I would say that uh, some of the results are definitely going to be robust, but I think it's important to show that uh, whether there's spurious precision or not. We do not use equivalent scales in, in Latin America when we measure inequality and poverty. We could try and see whether that's going to affect our results. I would guess that, uh, largely speaking, the main results will not be affected for this kind of study. Not that doesn't mean that using equivalent scales may not be important for other kinds of work. Uh, you asked also about the uh, the pass through. The pass through. Uh, well, the idea comes from something that Martin Ravalion wrote many years ago, but we're using the same pass through that the World Bank has been assuming for its bulk cal projections, which uh, it's a, there's a magic number of 0.85 that you multiply GDP by without any change uh, across countries, which may be a very rough approximation, but our results are not sensitive to the point in which it will matter that will that will matter a lot. I think what we'll see is that if tomorrow, for example, the IMF says, oh, you know, in Mexico, we we are not going to see, or in Brazil, probably, we're going to see that it's not going to be a contraction of 9%, it's going to be a contraction of 5%. That will affect on our projections, and we plan to adjust them as soon as we obtain the new the new uh, wheel projections to see how the uh, estimates change. But I don't think that making those changes in the context of our analysis, like a bigger or smaller pass through will alter a lot. But we could do some sensitivity analysis to that, given that it's a number that <laughs> could be as good as uh, what the, you know, the World Bank has decided to use for the POVCA. Uh, then, you know, the interesting question about the distinguishing between new programs and those that respond endogenously. In Latin America, there's practically no endogenous, uh, no programs that respond. Employment benefits usually very small, though the unemployment insurance covers a very small percentage of the population, which might be the only one in which you have the same type of, uh, if you want, automatic safety net as you have in the advanced countries. All the others have to be done by hand, by the by the policymakers. And some of the uh, programs, uh, have what they've done is they've used the current setup and they've increased maybe the transfer. But in other cases, they're entirely new programs. Both in the case of Brazil and Argentina, there are new programs that are covering households that not necessarily were covered before. There are mistakes. I think what we, we've heard is that there, uh, and especially we know more about Argentina because we have uh, studied it a little more. There's families who are receiving more than one program. And so, and then there's some that are you know, excluded for, from the previous and the current ones, and those mistakes uh, hopefully will be corrected as they're able to fine tune their deployment of the social assistance program. I think you're right in terms of trying to look at uh, the entire distribution impact and not just the Gini coefficient. Uh, we could also you know, test what happens with the tile and the coefficient of uh, variation to see what, what occurs with the aggregate or summary statistic or summary indicators that are not sensitive to the middle, but to the top and the bottom. 
but m my impression is that the bottom line of the conclusions will not be affected, but we can, we can, we can check that. By the way, the, the, I just want to emphasize one thing. The, we do have the anonymous incidence, growth incidence curves. We do have them online. They're not going to be in the, they're not in the paper, in the paper. I'm talking about now the, the paper that just focuses on the short-term effects, which is cited in, in, in our other paper. But if you want to see them, I can share them with you. Uh, and they're also U-shaped. But the ones that I showed are the non-anonymous. So we fix people by their pre-shock distribution and look at what the trajectories are. And uh, those are, in a way, measures of mobility in the short term in the sense of ex ante before the shock and exposed after the shock. The uh, anonymous ones have also a U-shape, and uh, you right probably would find that the Lorentz curves cross, so we may also produce some Lorentz curve comparisons to see what they look like uh, and, and put them online. They, they, we cannot add them to the paper. I'm glad you like the 10 by 10 matrix idea and the fact that we decided to uh, anchor the choice, if you want, of the scenarios that are shown in the 10 by 10. And I, rem I want to remind uh, viewers that the 10 by 10 is uh, to try to sort of distinguish between the cases in which you have fewer households losing a lot or a lot of households losing less, you know, which is the two possibilities. So far, we don't have enough information to choose from those. So that's why we showed the two scenarios. And let me stop here. Otherwise, poor Guido will have no time to respond. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, Nora. And, oh, sorry, may I? Okay, sorry. Uh, so thanks a lot, Nora, and, and thanks a lot to, to Michael and Stephen for their, their terrific comments. Um, um, I, I, will, I will try to uh, answer them, sorry for if I forget something, um, uh, starting chronologically uh, by Stephen comment, Stephen's comments. Uh, so uh, thanks a lot. So the, the, um, I will start with the cash transfer comments because this connects, of course, with the, what, what Nora said, um, uh, what, what we've seen in the short run, also that uh, these comments may offset something um, and also we know from the literature that cash transfers may also have an effect on education uh, conditional or unconditional ones um, but what we I think somehow learn also from our analysis that this also highly depends and interacts with the supply of education and I think in the uh, COVID time we have something which is really unique or it's maybe not unique but unique on that scale that uh, you know the supply of education is affected such that cash transfers um, uh, cannot uh, mitigate uh, these uh, these uh, these uh, uh, problems even if for example take families we know that uh, parental job loss leads uh, to higher dropout by children because they have to enter the labor market okay this might be here the case but it might also not be because there is no labor market in these sectors working at the moment but still there might be this educational loss and um and in this case, also the cash transfer can can't help because there is no supply to, of education to to where you know where where this could be compensated. Um, then l let me go to the comment about parental time, which uh, is very interesting actually. Um, in so in our analysis, we are assuming with the parent's role or parental uh, parental factor of substitution, as we call it, um, that uh, some parents somehow. Uh, substitute schooling. So you are, you are completely right that some parents might substitute it with their own time. Other parents may substitute it with, you know, private tutoring on online lessons or better technology, whatever. So uh, if this is correlated somehow with, uh, you know, uh, then then our parental factor of substitution is capturing all these uh, possibilities or capabilities by um, uh, more highly educated parents because they are more aware of the, the, the need now to invest in education than maybe parents with lower uh, socioeconomic status. Of course, this gives interesting, uh, you know, uh, ideas for the future. Look, for example, within 
socioeconomic groups if uh, this parental time issue is creating maybe new inequalities you know so i think this is very very a very very interesting uh, thing to look at uh, in the future when we will have data available to actually study the the learning losses so thanks a lot for this point so i i, I uh, uh hoping that i didn't so uh thanks for all the other comments and uh, i go to 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 michael uh so, so to some uh, questions of uh uh, that Michael, some comments that Michael made, starting from a clar clarification. Uh, so always in the second part of the exercise, when uh, we talk about upward mobility, it's in an intergenerational sense. So um, the the uh, upward mobility of children with respect to their parents' education. So sorry for having uh, not been clear enough on this sense and. Uh, Connected to this, I completely agree with you that uh, instruction or education is only one part of human capital. Of course, uh, there are many uh, facets, and uh, the other disciplines look at look at in, look at it more deeply. So, in our case, um, I would say that, uh, for example, social networks and health and everything else, um, if it is also in this case correlated with the learning loss uh, that we see uh, among socioeconomic groups. Um, then it shows that we are just looking at the tip of the iceberg, right? So if uh, a part of uh, the instructional dimension of human capital, there's also a nutrition dimension and the health dimension and so on. And if the inequalities here also reflects the inequality that we have on the instructional side, then we are really looking just at a small part of what it could actually be and this is the idea also of our study right so we that there could of course this is the longer run so the, this uh, a part of we all maybe being dead at this point uh, um, the, there is also the the thing that a lot of things can happen so the idea of our study is to give a perspective on what can actually happen to also as a as a as to give some uh, recommendation to this is something we have to care about right um uh, so I completely agree with, with all the dimensions, and I think that future studies, as soon as data is available to look at all these dimensions, will be necessary to know where to act uh, and, and which uh, policies will be more effective to uh, recover from these from these learning losses. And I also completely agree, and we have something on this going on, on uh, um, the, your, your point that if the... Um, if the instructional loss is not too long in terms of instructional time, it can be recovered. So there, there, there is literature looking at this. So how strong? There is no, uh, you know, um, rule of thumb number that says if the gap is not more than this, uh, then it can be recovered. But there are a lot of possible numbers. So, for example, if uh, less than half of a school year is lost, if less of 10% uh, and so on. So we take this literature into account and we build various scenarios. I've shown you one of these, which is uh, uh, if uh, not more than 25% of the year is lost, then uh, the year can be recovered, and otherwise it is lost. And uh, but in all scenarios that we try, we we see a gap. Okay, so um, uh, there is no scenario which shows there is no problem. We the, the, it will be recovered. Everything, especially at the bottom of the distribution, while at the top of the distribution we we see that of course if we relax this assumption, the gap is getting small and small and smaller until it dis disappears. So. Um, uh, let me uh, let me finish also with this uh, what you said about literacy and numeracy and uh, generally the quality of education is what uh, really matters also even looking just at the instruction and uh, this is a general problem so it's not only a problem in this study and of the situation now but uh, generally we see that uh, um, in in developing countries in Latin American countries um, usually uh, or sometimes uh, years of schooling is not a good predictor of uh, these actually quality measures so i think this also uh, opens uh, um, opens uh, interesting possibilities for future research which are being uh, investigated of course so there is research but i think there is uh, still a lot to do here to understand uh, what does really years of schooling mean and what does it really translates into uh, when the the schools are open or closed into uh, actual and objective measures measures of, of human capital and of destruction. So thanks a lot. This is uh, 
uh, these are very valid, very important points that we have to for sure discuss in our analysis and uh, that, uh, that, you know, uh, are important to address in the future. Great. Thank you so much, Guido. So, um, <clears throat> I'm going to have to bring our talk together to a close, but before I do, I wanted to ask uh, the, the authors if they could let us know when the paper will be available and if there is a previous paper that might also be available. Uh, it would be great just to hear uh, where, where and when it might be. I think we hope to have the, you know, by, by the end of the month, we'll have a version of this paper that will be a working paper version. And the previous, I mean, the, our, the first part came out in the COVID-19 CPR series. And I sent you the link to that one uh, in one of my emails. If you want me to send it again or, uh, you know, to post it here, I can do that. But, uh, but uh, I did share it with you. And there's also a longer version of the, that uh, where Guido is the lead author on the second part that uh, describes much more the, the methodological part. Uh, so you, you have all, all three, well, one is ready, the other one is, by, the other two by the end of October, you should have them. So send an email to uh, those of us here at IIEP, we'll be happy to forward the information to you. But that's it today from uh, Washington, D.C. Thank you all for joining us, and we'll see you next time facing inequality.